Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us for Side by Side Digital. I'm your host, Rebecca Shively. We've got a great episode lined up for you today. This month, we are talking about negotiations, and not just any negotiations, but how to negotiate with family. We know that running a family business comes with its own set of challenges, and we're here today to talk about how we can have better communication and negotiations to create win-win situations for everyone involved. We're joined by Alan Vanalik with the University of Nebraska Extension, who has a wealth of, in wealth of knowledge around this topic. Alan, I want to thank you for being with us today. I'll go ahead and turn it over to you. Thank you for having me. I appreciate that very much. So I am Alan Benalik. I work for the University of Nebraska, and I um, work with farm succession and transition. And uh, part of that succession transition, obviously, is some kind of a family negotiation, if you will. Uh, so that's why this is a good topic for me to talk about. And, and I guess my qualification is that uh, not only did I grow up on a farm, and uh, there was a farm transition where my brother took over that farm. But in addition to that, I, I did actually go to a four-day negotiation workshop out at Harvard University back about five years ago, four or five years ago. And I, I bring some of that information to this discussion, too. Here's how you get a hold of me. That's my phone number. That's my email address. And that's my website. And uh, so you, you're welcome to get a hold of me anyway. You can, any of those methods are just fine. I know that if you call that phone number, that's to my office. And so... I don't, I'm not in the office a lot because I'm out teaching or out doing stuff. So, so just uh, leave a message. I'll get back to you because it does come to me no matter where I'm at with my cell phone and what's, what's going on. Okay. So topics are how, how were we taught to negotiate? How are our parents taught to negotiate? Uh, what can we good communications look like? How do we change the mindset to create that value to get to a win-win instead of a win-lose? And how do we deal with difficult people, especially when we deal with emotions, uh, showing good appreciation, uh, some of those things. I'll, you'll find out more about that as we get to it. So I don't want to spend much time on that. I want to get going. How often do we negotiate? We negotiate all the time. I mean, you got the used car salesman or the used tractor salesman there. You got the grand, for me, it's the grandkids. For some of you, the children, obviously. And I want a candy bar. I want a candy bar. I want a candy bar. And so are you going to be a good papa or are you going to be a mean papa? Are you going to get them a candy bar? And I get them a candy bar. And more importantly, how do we negotiate with uh, families when it comes especially to uh, just to come up with a way to make that farm transition or succession start. It's negotiations is simply a back and forth process designed to reach an agreement when you have both a shared and opposed views or issues. And uh, that's just a simple definition for negotiation. Typically what's happened is, um, you know, you go to buy, go use, let's say you're going to go buy a used tractor. Uh, at the top of the screen there, at the top of the slide, the, the used tractor salesman says, yeah, you want to be interested in that tractor? I'll sell it to you for 50000 you at the bottom of the slide there on the left-hand side say, uh, I tell you what, today, uh, I'm in a hurry. I'll, I'll, I'll tell you what, right now, cash, 40000 And the salesman goes, you know, well, I, I, can't, I can't do that. But, you know, you're a good guy. You've been a good customer. I can let you have it for, I can let you have it for 48 It's kind of today only, final offer. And then you get down to your, the second line from the bottom there and you go, well, I tell you what, I understand 40 is probably too low. How about 42 and then the, the, uh, then there's always the threat to walk. The salesman says, I got other people to see. I got people to get you out of the country. You know, tractors, are, tractors are really hard to come by right now. Uh, you know what? I'll, I'll let you have it for, for 46. And you go, well, you know, I got to go irrigate yet. I got to go get hay put up. I got cattle to start weaning. I got all kinds of stuff happening. Uh, but maybe, maybe I could just go as high as 44 because I do need a tractor. And then if you haven't haw around some more, you end up splitting the, splitting the difference and getting for 45000 um, so let's demonstrate that with the Rebecca. Will you be my volunteer, Rebecca? I think you, I, I think we talked about that you could do this. Are you there with me? Yep, I'm here. Uh, very good. So um, I'm trying to figure out how to look at you. I, I, I have all my, I have my screen show. I won't worry about that. That's okay, all right. So Rebecca, I'm going to sell you a widget and you're going to try and buy a widget. Are you okay with that? Yeah, I've actually been in the market for a widget lately. You come into my store, it's a retail store on Main Street, USA, and you need a widget, and I sell widgets. Okay, so, um, so hey, Rebecca, what are you looking for today? Yeah, I'm actually in the market for, for a widget. I've uh, got, a, got a need for that on my operation. Uh, what, what kind of things do you have in stock? I have, I have the latest and greatest widget right over here on the shelf. I have several of them. You can pick whichever one you want. And I tell you what, today and today only, I'll let you have a widget for $20. Oh, uh, I mean, I was kind of looking around on Amazon. It looked like they're running more like 10. Like, is that, 
Is that the best you can do or a little wiggle room on that? Any sales going uh, on? So, yeah. So the Amazon thing's kind of interesting because, you know, there's, there's, I mean, there's no service that comes with that. There's no, there's no backup to the sale. I mean, you're going to work with a local dealer here and that, that's worth something to you. I know it has to be. And uh, even though you don't want to admit it, even though you get free shipping, if you're an Amazon member, it still costs you something. You got to pay that membership fee. So, but listen, I tell you what, I could, I could probably let you have it for 17. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, money's really tight right now, you know, and inflation, the economy, there's just a lot going on. Uh, you know, is there, is there any way you can do better on that? Well, what, what do you offer me? Uh, I mean, I can, I can meet you kind of part way. We'll go like a 12. Well, listen, listen, Rebecca, I, I think we can probably do, but I, I just need to do a little, just a little bit better than that. I mean, I got a bottom line. I got, I got my kids to feed. I got things happening here. How about 15? Yeah, I mean, I am kind of in a hurry. I got other stuff to do. Um, it's better, better than I thought, still higher than Amazon, but I can probably live with it. All right. So thank you. We just made a deal. Okay. What we just demonstrated to you and what I just demonstrated with the tractor is that we're, how are we taught to negotiate? We were taught to negotiate by the way we had to win. That's the way my dad taught me to negotiate. I remember very distinctly going to buy, to, to, um, Go get a used tractor when I was a kid, about 13, 14, 15 years old, something like that, early teens. I go with my dad to the, to the John local John Deere dealer. We get a used tractor, and we, and we spent two hours, two solid hours in a salesman's office. And, and that, was, that wasn't the worst part. The worst part was the salesman smoked. He, he, was, he just chained chain cigarette after chain cigarette after chain cigarette. This was in the late 60s, early 70s, and it was just, it was just a long time. It was forever. And the bottom line is, um, it was, it was miserable for me because I, I, that was a, really a problem. So how do we, but, but dad negotiated for two hours for the splitting a hundred bucks. So we, we got a hundred dollars in two hours and he got, he, I mean, we had to pay $50 more and the salesman had to give up $50, but it took two hours to get that done. We get back in the truck, we're going home and this is late in the 60s, early seventies. But you know what? Um, dad was really proud of that negotiation because essentially, you know, wages, wages on a farm were about a buck, 75 cents to a buck, maybe a buck and a quarter an hour. That would have been about it. That was it. That was it. That's all you had. I mean, you were talking about 10, the era of 10 cent soda, soda bottles and, and the era of five cent uh, candy bars and the era of uh, 35 cent hamburgers. Okay. I mean, it's just, we have to remember this is a whole different deal. Inflation had hit anything compared to now. The point is, I get in a truck. I said, Dad, we just wasted two hours, but all we got was $50. Was that worth it? He goes, hey, where else were we going to make $25 an hour this afternoon? And that was, but, but I'm trying to point that out. I'm trying to make a big deal out of this because we have to understand that when we're, especially when we're working with our parents or with older aunts and uncles and people in a different generation, how are we all taught to negotiate? We we're taught that we had to win. And, and what, what we fail to recognize is that will winning work if we have to win with family members, especially if they feel like they lost. How will they feel? What the, how does that make them feel like? And I, I don't think that's that's probably the outcome we need and that's the outcome we should be striving for and trying. So I'm trying to get us to think about what better outcomes would look like. That's what we're trying to do. And interestingly enough, I mean, we probably look at that this list on this slide and say, hey, uh, these outcomes are, you know, uh, reaching an agreement, that's a good outcome, not fighting, good outcome, some sense of equality or, or fairness, that's a good outcome. Winning uh, kind of kind of said that, and, and you're breaking their bottom line. That's a good outcome if you're going for a used car, or used tractor, or something like that. But not a good outcome for the family. And interestingly enough, if you look at those those common and replied outcomes of what a good what a good outcome is for certain people, if you look at that list, it'll be different for every person on that list. Some people think that not fighting is is a good outcome. Some people will think that winning is a good outcome. Some people will say reaching agreement is a good outcome. But um, so you have to think that through a little bit before you start, because uh, you have to maybe maybe even have the conversation. What's going to be a good outcome for you even before you start talking about what the money might be, that sort of thing. Um, and, and the other thing I would say about this is just is just simply this. Always when you have to come up with a, a negoti ne ne negotiated agreement, and even with family members, always know uh, what your backup position is. The backup position should be what happens if I don't get to an agreement? What's my best alternative to no agreement? What if I don't have an agreement? What does that look like? And so understand that, that you always have that fallback position and always think about what that can look like because that's an important 
part of um, uh, the, the preparation you need to do to make a good negotiation. As a matter of fact, what's interesting about the Harvard experience when I was there for the four days, they kind of start the workshop off by saying the 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 good to get to a good outcome on negotiation, it, it, there's three rules. And we all get in our notebooks out, and we're all ready to write it down. And they go, the three rules are prepare, prepare, prepare. Uh, and so that would go probably for all parties. Let's let's prepare for that negotiation a little bit before we just head straight head strong straight into it. Because if we're not prepared, then then we're going to accept an outcome that we wouldn't accept normally. So please think that through and know what you're going to do. So as you think about selling and buying widgets, everyone's motivation may be different. For instance, I was a seller in this case. What if I have lots of inventory and it hasn't been moving and I got to get cash in the barrel head to, to pay my bills or get my family fed? Am I going to be motivated to, to, do, to make that $15 deal instead of having to wait for $20 to come along? Yes, I will be. But what if I know that uh, Rebecca has, excuse me, Rebecca's coming for a widget and it's been a hot seller and hey, Rebecca doesn't want to give me 20, I'll probably still sell two or three this afternoon. Do I have to make any deal with her? Absolutely not. That's the way it is in, in most retail stores. You don't make a deal at all because you don't, you don't have to. There's no motivation to do it because if you're not, you know, if Rebecca isn't dumb enough to pay $20, there'll be so many people in later this afternoon, they'll be dumb enough to pay $20. I don't mean dumb. I mean, I'm, what I'm trying to say is, we just don't tend to negotiate on stuff like that. Now, Rebecca's motivation is, may, well, could be different too. I mean, what if this is the only widget for 100 miles? She needs a widget today. And she's probably going to be willing to pay $20. But what if it's last year's model? Well, maybe she only wants to pay 10. And she won't pay more because this year's model's got the doohickey on it. And she's got to have this year's model. Then she's willing to pay a little bit more. Or what if uh, you advertise it as this year's model with a warranty, and so she's willing to pay 20? I mean, if everybody's motivation changes depending on what, what your background is, what you got going on with you and for you. So just understand, think about that too. And also try and think about if you're buying, think about the seller's motivation is. If you're selling, think about the buyer's motivation is. I mean, we all know how hot the farm machinery market's been. I mean, if you find a tractor that you've been looking for and you want it, Guess what you get to do? You get to pay a lot of money to get that tractor, probably in today's market at least. Uh, unless something's changed in the last 30 days, I would think that that's probably correct. So, well, what I'm trying to say, especially with families, negotiations should not be about winning. It should be about how do we create value? How do we create a win-win? We have to think out of the box and bring more, more uh, stuff into this negotiation process. We have to bring more ideas into it because there's always a way to get creative and come up with a way so that both parties feel like they've had their needs met and both parties feel like they, they, they didn't lose. <laughs> That's the big thing. Just make sure you didn't lose. So just understand that. I mean, okay, there's a, there's a crisis between Ecuador and Peru. And I looked it up this morning. This crisis went on for about 150 years where they battled over where the border was between the, the countries of Ecuador and Peru and South America. 150 year skirmish, if you will. They fought over this ground for all those decades and decades and decades. Well, and this is a story that was told to us out at Boston at Harvard for the, for the uh, negotiation deal. Um, one, of the, one of the Harvard professors told the story and says, I was on a team that taught this young politician from Peru about, um, about how to negotiate. And, and as luck would have it, four or five years after that Peruvian politician came to uh, Harvard, Cambridge, to get to his training, he got elected president of Peru. And he knew that one thing he wanted to do as president is to get this border location thing gone, dissolved, finished. He wanted to get that put away. So he, he, he did what Harvard suggested. He would prepare, prepare, prepare. He actually brought some people from Harvard down to his, his uh, capital, Peru, in Peru, to, to talk about what could be done and to help him prepare. And so then he had the great, great big summit or conversation with the president from Ecuador. And he starts the conversation by simply saying, say, Mr. President, you've been a president for quite a long time, whatever it was. He was an established, you know, monarchy or whatever, whatever they have done. Here. I'm a brand new president of my country. Tell me what I need to know to be a president of a South American country. What, what, what have you found to be helpful? And by doing that, by appreciating what the, the and, and showing respect 
for the other party and appreciating and, and showing uh, good uh, listening skills to the other party. He established this basis, this relationship, this, this friendliness that went on to uh, settle that dispute. As a matter of fact, I, I read that in a couple of years, they had the dispute all settled and all the arms were put away and they didn't fight anymore. And they sat, one of the parts of the settlement was that they actually set up national uh, parks, like, like a place to, to play, like Mahoney Park here in Nebraska, a place to go hang out and play on both sides of the border, right next to each other. So you had national parks on both sides. And so the, so the land was getting utilized and um, nobody felt like anybody was getting ahead. It was, it was park land and, and everybody can enjoy that. So, okay, let's take that, instead of being at the national or international level, let's take that to the farm. A lot of times we're talking about how to negotiate for the farm and what to do at the farm. And, and quite honestly, um, so I, I, if you haven't listened to me before, just know that I tell stories to illustrate my point. The story I'll tell here is from a young family, young farm family, that were on the that was on the farm. They went there after grandpa and grandma left. And this young man, his wife, and he had a couple of kids out there on the farm. Small family, and and uh, uh, they were trying to start talking to his parents. Grandparents are gone now. Trying to talk to the parents about what do I do to get this farm because I need I need it. And it was a small farm, northern Nebraska. I need every acre I can to make this thing work. I can't have I cannot not have the acres. I need them badly. And uh, so they talked about that. A little bit, and so it turns out that his he had only had one brother. the The farmer only had one brother, and the one brother was kind of causing trouble. I mean, he he didn't want to necessarily give up his right to some of that farm ground. And the mom and dad never lived on a farm. They were always um, they were always in town. They had off farm jobs, and they just weren't. It just wasn't their thing. And so he's trying, but, but they owned the ground, right? Because they got it from their grandparents, we got it from the grandpa. And so uh, they had the two boys and uh, the off-farm boy is asking like, he acting like he wants some of the farm ground. So they asked the off-farm brother, why are you interested in this farm ground? He says, I want it because I always hunted there and I still want to be able to hunt. And I said, I, so, I, so I said, well, I immediately said, okay, how, we, how can we create more value? I said, listen, what if your brother got the house in town all the retire remaining retirement equities, their their insurance money, and their and their you know household sale uh, contents and, and all that stuff, would that be equal to about what the farm's equal to? And then the farmer goes, yeah, it kind of would be uh, dollar wise. It'd be about the same. I said, okay, so why don't you set that up? Did you get the farm? He gets everything else instead of the farm, all the other assets of the of his of their parents. But you give your brother one more thing, and that is you give him a hunting easement to be able to go out to your farm and hunt during hunting season every year for the rest of his life. And they just did like, you can see the light bulb just come on with that couple because they had, here we have a chance. Here's here we created more value between the two of us and we can get through this, you know, put and, and get this worked out very well. And always, you have to always think out of the normal, think about what else could be added to the value for younger families. Maybe you substitute labor or goods for cash. I mean, obviously that was always, my generation's way of doing it to do labor and goods for cash. I think we have to re rethink that a little bit and kind of be on top of that and make sure that we understand that that's, that's still a viable option. So I'm just talking about how or there are ways to create more value that's really important. Now I'm going to show you a video from the original Star Wars movie. Since this is a younger crowd, you probably know the Star Wars movies. This is the first Star Wars movie, and this is the cantina scene where Luke and Obi-Wan go see Han Solo and Chewbacca to get a ride to the Alderaan galaxy. They got to go get that image or that information to Leia and to 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 be able to fight the to to be able to fight the the bad guys, the Imperials. So watch how this negotiation goes and see if they created any value in this negotiation. Here we go. Solo. I'm Captain of the Millennium Falcon. Chewie here tells me you're looking for passage to the Alderaan system. Yes, indeed. If it's a fast ship. Fast ship? You've never heard of the Millennium Falcon? Should I have? It's the ship that made the Kessel run in less than 12 parsecs. I've outrun Imperial starships. Not the local bulk cruisers, mind you. I'm talking about the big Karelian ship. Ah, uh, that's on me. Sorry. Ships now. She's fast enough for you, old man. What's the cargo? Only passengers. 
myself, the boy, two droids, and no questions asked. What is it, some kind of local trouble? Let's just say we'd like to avoid any imperial entanglements. Well, that's the real trick, isn't it? And it's going to cost you something extra. Ten thousand, all in advance. Ten thousand? Well, we can almost buy our own ship for that. But who's going to fly it, kid? You? You bet I could. I'm not such a bad pilot myself. We don't have to sit here and listen. We can pay you two thousand now, plus fifteen when we reach Alderaan. Seventeen. Okay, you guys got yourselves a ship. We'll leave as soon as you're ready. Docking Bay 94. 94. And, they, and uh, Han Solo looks up to see the Imperial st uh, Stormtroopers coming to get him, so they had to shoot their way out of the cantina. But did we create more value with that? Did we create more value there? And I would submit, yeah, we did. Uh, instead of getting 10, he got 17. Did he get it right up front? No, he got it later. Did he care? No, because he was Han Solo. And he was going to make it, you know. And, and so even though that trip was arduous and it was uh, full of all kinds of thrills, which is uh, typical for a Star Wars movie, they did make it and he did get paid, but he didn't end up leaving because, well, you'd have to watch the show to figure that all out. But anyway, the, the point is they created more value and they made the deal and they both felt like they won. The, the people got their trip and the other guy got paid very, very well for that. Okay. Now, if you haven't figured it out, the only way to create this value and the only way to make this all work out for a negotiation process is to communicate. Uh, it's the most important part of the negotiation process. As a matter of fact, I thought about my four days at, at Cambridge at Harvard at that workshop, and I would tell you for a great deal of certainty that 75 to 80% of that workshop was on good communication. Nothing else, good communication. So here's what I'm asking you to, to consider. Consider that you have to seek first to understand before you can be understood. You have to listen. You have to build appreciation, respect, and trust. And you have to prove to the other party to listen accurately to their side of the story and to their concerns before you can even start negotiation. That's the key point of communication and the key base bedrock of making a good negotiation attempt. Um, you have to ask clarifying questions, listen for the answer, listen for the answer, listen for the answer, ask another question. This is repeat and ask another question. And you don't try and talk about yourself. So, hey, Rebecca, jump back on and let's um, talk about this communication thing for a second, okay? Yeah. Are you back with me? All right. Yep, I'm here. All right. So, um, Rebecca, just you, you, you kind of say whatever you want to. I'm just going to, you know, whatever. All right. So, what are you going to do after work today? What, what's happening with you? What do you, what do you got planned? Yeah, we're actually hosting a Young and Beginning Farmer Conference starting tomorrow. So work doesn't really end until Friday, but we're really excited to welcome a bunch of people who are coming in to network, learn some really great, valuable skills, of, and it's going to be an awesome event. So we're really looking forward to that. You know what? I, and you know what I'm looking forward to? I'm looking forward to going home and trying to beat back to my house by about five o'clock tonight because my wife and I have had volleyball tickets since 2001 for Nebraska Husker Volleyball. And I know they're playing Creighton tonight at CHI in Omaha starting at five o'clock. And I've already texted the, the channel number to my wife on our, on our cable TV network so she can have the TV all tuned up and ready to go so we can watch the Huskers try to beat Creighton. And I'm really kind of nervous about it because they're, they've been, they've, although they've won every match, they're five and oh, and they they've, haven't lost a set yet. I feel like they're still struggling with how they're gonna put this offense together. And they gotta figure that out and have good passing and good setting to get this all to work right. And I don't know where if they're going to get that done or not. So it makes me very nervous. But the whole point is, I'm excited to go see the Huskers play Creighton tonight. All right. So listen, let's let's review that conversation. Did I really listen to anything uh, Rebecca had to say? No. Why? Because I didn't ask her a question to find out what she was doing. I asked her a question to find out about, to be able to talk about me. I wanted to talk about me. I didn't care about what she said. So is that communi good communication? Is that seeking first to understand before you can be understood? No, it was terrible. So Rebecca, we're going to try again. All right. So Rebecca, um, and you could change your answer or stick with the same answer. So what do you got going on after work today? 
Uh, well, I'll keep it the same because it's the truth. So we're hosting a conference for Young and Beginning Producers here in Sioux Falls, South Dakota. Um, we have a bunch of awesome speakers lined up. We have some keynotes, some breakouts. Uh, it's going to be really fun, good food, good networking, and we're just really excited to uh, welcome our conference attendees. It's going to be an awesome turnout. So about, so, so, so how many young, beginning, young and Beginning Farmers you got coming up to Sioux Falls? Uh, around 120, 150. So oh, should that's be, a nice yeah, crowd. yeah, should be a good crowd. And so where do you have that at? Where, what's the, what's your location? Yeah. So we're going to be, uh, downtown Sioux Falls, uh, right on the riverfront. So beautiful, beautiful scenery, great venue, good food. I think I was, I think I was at the conference at that hotel once, maybe possibly, and, and you can actually walk to Sioux Falls if you want to from there. Yep. Lots of awesome stuff nearby. Very walkable. So yeah. Right. That's, that's awesome. That's awesome. So, so who are you most interested in hearing? Which, which of the main speakers do you want to hear the, the most? What do you, who thinks got the best message? I mean, it's hard to pick a favorite, but we do have a uh, coach Stegelmeyer from SDSU. So I think that's going to be a real fan favorite here in the crowd. Is that SDSU that played uh, Iowa to a seven to three game last Saturday? Sounds right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was a rock fight. Anyway, so the, the point is, you can have a great conference and you're done when? About noon on Friday then? Yep. Yep. We'll wrap up and around noon. Fantastic. Have a great conference. Yeah, it should be fun. Okay. All right. So in the second conversation, did I say anything about me? No. What was I doing? I was asking for the answer, repeating it, or showing that I heard it, and try to ask another clarifying question so I would learn more. So I would appreciate what the other person is saying. So I would prove to them that I'm listening. We don't get anywhere with any negotiation unless we, with anyone, unless we prove that we've heard what they've said. And the only way to prove that you heard what they've said is either repeat it back to them or, or ask a question that clarifies what they've said and keep going with that. It's the only way you have a chance of negotiation is to get to clarifying questions put in place so that you show proper appreciation. So what's going on there? So, so you have a chance of getting going on what's going on. We make lots of communications mistakes, and I want to point out there's more than this list, since I wish somebody would tell me more what they all are, but, but there are other communication mistakes, but here's a few that I thought of, and I put them on the list. We ask a question not to find out what the other person says, but to say what I wanted to say. And by the way, that's what I just did with Rebecca. I talked about volleyball instead of talking about what she had going on. Um, and, uh, <laughs> and so the interesting anecdotal information there is that, uh, and I kind of make a joke out of this. So the bottom line is uh, it, my friends will always ask me about me and anybody that anybody that doesn't ever take time to ask me about me is not really my friend. And for some of them, I still have to talk to them. They happen to be the relatives. <laughs> so there's, that's a terrible joke, but, but it's, it's about the truth, unfortunately. Um, but you, you, if you have to ask about the other person, you know, instead of just talking about yourself all the time, otherwise you're not a true friend. Uh, making assumptions of what someone else will say before they actually say it, that's that's always a bad mistake. Thinking about how we will respond while the other person is talking, that's always kind of a mistake. I have to be careful as the, I used to, I was in a county off, county extension office for 30 years before I had this job. And you have to think very carefully about that because there was times where, where I thought I knew how to respond and I started thinking about my response and then they would hit me up with something that I had, had not anticipated and, there, and I have to change my whole response while I'm talking to them because I, didn't, I have to listen properly. And so I have to stop and listen first and then come up with the response after they get done talking and after I show proper appreciation and ask, after I ask those clarifying questions. And then the other, the other issue is, I, have, I specifically struggle with this when it comes to my parents, excuse me, my, my wife and my children. I try to fix the issues they're describing without being asked. And um, what's, what's happening there is, um, so you have to see this video to understand what I'm trying to say. You don't try to jump in and fix an issue without being asked. And here's what that looks like. Hang on, I'll pull that up right for you right now. It's a very short video. It's just, there's all this pressure, you know? And sometimes it feels like it's right up on me and I can just feel it, like literally feel it in my head and it's relentless. And I don't know if it's gonna stop. I mean, that's the thing that scares me the most is that I don't know if it's ever gonna stop. Yeah. You do have a nail in your head. It is not about the nail. 
Are you sure? Because, I mean, I'll bet if we got that out of there. Stop would... trying to fix it. No, I'm not trying to fix it. I'm just pointing out that maybe the nail is causing... You always do this. You always try to fix things when what I really need is for you to just listen. No, see, I don't think that is what you need. I think what you need is to get the nail See, out. you're not even listening now. Okay, fine. I will listen. Fine. It's just... Sometimes it's like there's this achy... I don't know what it is. And I'm not sleeping very well at all. And all my sweaters are snagged. I mean, all of them. Yeah, I, that sounds really hard. It is. Thank you. Ow! Oh, come on! Ow. If you would just don't <laughs> try to see things my way, do I have to? The bottom line. So I hope you enjoyed that. The bottom line about that is just simply, we have to understand that um, we sometimes people just want to complain. Sometimes people just want to vent. Sometimes people just want to bellyache. We have to let that go. Just let that go. Don't take it in internally. Just let them let them do their thing. Let it hit the wall. Let it fall. That's not your problem. That's theirs. Just let it go. Don't try and fix it. However, if they say, what do you think I should do? Or what are some of my possible solutions? Then you jump in, obviously, but until you have that opening, until they invited you to say something, just let them vent, just let them do their thing. And uh, so just one of the communications mistakes we can make, and it's one that I get caught into because I'm trying to fix stuff for my wife or my children uh, and other people that I work with closely. So just, just know that that's, that can be an issue and try and avoid it. When you're negotiating in the family, here's some, there's always emotions involved, and there's emotions involved, especially as we're talking about the the, the items, the, the the contents, the materials, the the the, the land, the grandma's yellow pipe plate that came over from Germany or wherever, uh, all that sort of thing. So um, here's some emotions that you need to look out for and make sure you diffuse and get and get these taken care of so that you can have proper negotiation. Uh, appreciation I've talked about a lot. All people want to be is appreciated. They, are they being listened to? Did you listen to them properly? Did you, did, you, did you follow them and ask clarifying questions? That's enough about that. Affiliation. Are we treating that family member as a colleague or as an adversary? And think that through in your mind because if you're treating it as somebody you have to win against an adversary, then how are they going to feel? They're going to feel like they're feeling like you're trying to take advantage of them. So please treat the people you have to talk to as colleagues and as family members, not adversaries. Autonomy is, is are we treating everyone with, that's ability, able to make decisions? Um, are, we, are we blocking them the ability to make decisions? Or are we giving them a free, a free reign to make the decisions they can make? A status means, are we, are we treating everyone as full family members or, or, or in full members of the conversation? Or are we treating them as inferior? I, I mean, I, I, I just witnessed um, my mother-in-law passed away. And here about three weeks ago, we had her household contents auction. My brother-in-law was the executor of the state and the auctioneer treated him with the utmost uh, respect and uh, treated him with full recognition. But he treated my brother-in-law, my, my wife and my sister-in-law, the two sisters of the family that's being selling the material, he treated them very poorly because he treated them as inferior. It was very obvious to me that he had a status problem with women, and, and I, I, I thought it was ridiculous. I thought he was being dumb. Uh, and then what role do you have? And so I guess my point is be careful about that. And then what role do you have? Do you, are you giving everybody a proper role? Or are you giving them the actual proper responsibilities or fulfilled with the role that you have in that situation? Be careful of autonomy, status, and role because us old white guys, including myself probably included, do a terrible job of giving a pro proper autonomy, status, and role to women. And we do a terrible job of giving it to the next generation lower, our younger, our younger generation, men or women. So, and it's, the sad thing about that is that young women, uh, tend, we tend to give them two strikes when we're working with them. So just be careful of that. And especially uh, make sure you're, the people that you're working with, the older people especially, are doing the right thing there. Um, difficult people, I want to touch upon them because they are interesting cats to deal with because especially as old Germans or old Czech or old Polish or old whatever, that older generation, they will typically not want to talk about these difficult subjects at times. They'll want to walk away. Uh, they'll never make the first offer. They'll stay silent. They'll stall. They'll, they'll change the subject. They'll go on to something else because they don't want to talk about it. 
Um, they want to try and be pushy or they'll intimidate if they need to, if they're if they're that mean. Uh, they try to act like they have the higher authority and and or they just with just flat withhold information. They don't tell everybody everything they know. And so the difficult people are interesting cats to deal with because they use those tactics to get away with not having to communicate properly or come up with a good uh, plan for the future. The difficulty might be, the reason they're doing this is because uh, that generation, my generation and my parents' generation, quite honestly, was uh, taught that my business is my business only and I don't share my business. That's my, my personal information. So I won't tell other people what I'm thinking. And I don't have to, I, that would just, I, that's not what I've been taught. I have to just keep my, my business and my business only. For sure, people my age don't want to give up control. They don't want to think about being in control. And in some cases, some of us just got control. Like for instance, if my mother-in-law owned the farm ground and I was trying to farm it, when would I have gotten control? On June 2nd, when she passed away, and here I am later in my life, and I would just get control this summer. And, and really, um, that so I don't want to think about not being in control because I need to be in control for a while because I just got the ground clear from my mother-in-law or whatever it happens to be. I'm just giving that as an example. Um, I don't want to think about death, so I'm not going to talk to you about what happens to my farm next. I'm going to avoid those thoughts because I don't think about it. And by the way, most farmers or ranchers right now, uh, older ones, my age and older, do not want to think about not farming or ranching. They don't have any plans to retire whatsoever. Most of them don't. So just understand that. And then last, you know, I'm the I'm the dumb farmer that stayed on the farm and said, I, I didn't go to school. I just stayed out here. I don't, and so they have this, uh, this uh, lower opinion of themselves. They shouldn't, but they do sometimes. And they just don't feel appreciated by their family members because nobody's ever stopped asking them about them necessarily. They never shared a lot because they don't share. And so they don't feel appreciated. So they don't think they, they think they could be difficult because of some of these things. And there's other things to go on this list, but that's just a beginning list. And it gives you, gives you the idea of thinking about it. Um, <clears throat> so I, there's no magic bullet here. And I can give you these, these thoughts. And you may, may try and use them and they may not work at all. I don't know. But uh, you, the only way to, to, to change a difficult personality is that you cannot just ignore them. You have to increase communication. For that is, I mean, make them feel appreciated. Make them feel like they're a part of something. Get them to talk about anything else to begin with. They get them to talk about something. So you can have a conversation. So you can have that exchange. Ask them clarifying questions. If that doesn't work, and we, you know what? And then the only way to get them to talk, you know, it used to be for 30 years, we could get them to talk about Husker football. Everybody enjoyed Husker football. Now, no one cares. And so you can't go that one. You probably have to go with the weather. Sorry. Uh, third bullet, make you find a kingmaker that the king will listen to. In other words, if you can talk with somebody that won't talk to you, find out who they will talk to. <clears throat> maybe that's a friend. Maybe it's a clergy. Maybe it's, maybe it's your, your mother-in-law, the, the wife of the king. The king. Uh, find out find out who they'll listen to and get them to talk to them um, and, or their banker or whoever they'll listen to. And then sometimes you give them choices and ask for a preference rather than give them, hey, what do you think we ought to do about? You say, are we going to do A, B, or C? Just tell me. So I'll, I'll start working on it. And uh, just 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 try and, and if they don't like that, then they'll stop and say, no, there's a D. Here it is. And then you have to just work with them off of that. But at least you gave them choices and got them started to talk about it. That's, that's, those are all important. So in summary, we were all taught to how, how were we taught to communicate? We had to win. How do we set up communication for proper negotiation? Listen. How do we change the mindset to create more value? We have to get to win-win. How do we create the wins? And how do we get creative about coming up with solutions? And then what do the emotions, the communications, and, and diff, dealing with difficult people, and how do we get through those emotions and understand them? Yeah, that's what I think is a summary of what you need to know to have good communications for farmsteads and farm, farm work and ranch work and getting on with your life and doing the right thing. Um, okay, now, I, wanna, I got a couple other things I want to mention quick before I run out of time. I started a program called LandLink last year. I'm, I'm trying to address two problems. Land seekers don't have access to land that they can farm a ranch. That's the younger people. The older people does not have a succession path, meaning their children are not coming back to the farm or ranch or they don't have children. And they're wanting to keep their operation as their operation. So, I'm trying to let both groups, the man, land seekers and the landowners, register or get put into the system for LandLink. And we're trying to use, do have separate applications for both groups. And the applications are reviewed and we try and follow up with phone interviews, phone conversations, and we're trying to match land seekers with landowners. 
and then the landowners decide who they want to interview. You know, the, I don't have anything to do with that. The landowner decides who they want to talk to. And if you're interested in land links, there's some introductory videos, some other information about that at cap.unl.edu. Uh, it's, it's a for, look for land link. And if you got any questions, make sure you let me know. Um, I'd be glad to help you with that. Right now, I have about 150 land seekers in the system, and I have left probably about 10 landowners in the system, maybe not even. So it's a, I, I'm skewed pretty bad, like 15 to 1. So be, please... Uh, Please understand, I can always use more landowners in the system, and there you go. The other thing I'll throw out is that uh, we have a returning to the farm workshop. Returning to the farm is going to be happening uh, here on December 9, 10 in person in New York at Holtus Convention Center. There's follow-up webinars in January and February of next year. There's a registration fee. I think we set it at $75 to, just to cover expenses in New York for the, for the Holtus and for the food. And uh, if you got it, that's December 9, 10, and returning to the farm is uh, for multi-generations, two or three generations to come into one place and sit as a family at a table and listen to some of this stuff I've talked about, but in addition to getting some other specialists in to talk about how to make a good transfer, how to set up a good plan to make sure the young, older generation has gets the younger generation back in successfully, but the older generation has a, a successful exit. If they want an exit, if they don't want an exit, how are we going to make sure that we just make this all congruent and make this all work. They have the, the, the funds they need in, in their uh, older years to cover the health insurance and to cover uh, uh, any trips that they want to go on. And younger people have enough assets and, and, and that to make, a, to make a successful operation continue. So returning to farm workshop is happening in December 9-10. Any questions about that, make sure you let, let me know about those things. So that was my talk. And I got a couple minutes left. Let's see if there's any questions or not. I don't remember that part. Rebecca, are you going to? Uh, okay. Yep, okay. we've had a we've had a couple come in. Um, so one of them is around that idea of creating more value. So how do you create more value for off farm heirs when most of the older generation's net worth is tied up in land? All the siblings want some land, but the acres are needed by the on farm heir for the farm to survive. Um, any ideas on how you can get creative or what can be done to be fair? Well, you know the. What 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 my generation had to go through is that you know, we had to we had to get to work on the farm and then buy off those other those other those other brothers and sisters for their land, and and, and the, the downside of that right now is that land is is so expensive. If I have to buy off, let's say there's four kids in the family, and I'm the on farm kid, and I've got to buy off my brothers and my sisters, uh, brother and two sisters, let's say. If I have to, if I only have twenty five percent equity, um, and they want their money, we, we're we're out of. I'm out of business. There's no way to make that work in today's land environment. Um, the, the price. So the thing that we have to do is get the whole family to understand that if the, if mom and dad's uh, mom and dad's objective was to make sure that the, that that son or that daughter was on farm, gets to continue the farming operation. If they want to continue that, then we have to set up create paths for that to happen. And some of those paths may be long-term lease agreements for the for the other kids. It may be um, a, a, a lease agreement or with an option to buy first option first right of refusals. That sort of thing. It may be that you get to lease at eighty or ninety percent of the UNL survey rate. It may be that you get to purchase at seventy percent of appraised value. It may be there may be all kinds of little tricks we can do there to create to create an environment where that on farm kid has a has a chance to um, stay on the farm uh, and keep going and then and, and get the other people paid off. Uh, you know, I think one strategy we're missing maybe that has needs to be considered. I think is buying uh, life insurance. The on farm kid buying life insurance on his parents. Uh, he becomes a beneficiary of that insurance policy when the parents pass and he uses some of that money to, to reimburse the other kids for equipment or reimburse the other kids for some of the land and that sort of thing. Um, and, 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 and so I think through the, the use of uh, life insurance, the use of discounted, uh, discounted uh, rental rates, the use of uh, purchase agreements, you know, first right refusal agreements, those kind of things, um, I think you can make it work. But you really have to plan that ahead and plan it carefully because otherwise you put the on-farm kid out of business. Great. Um, kind of related to that idea of planning, but do you have any suggestions when you're going into kind of a negotiation or a meeting, like how to set the stage properly? Should it always be in person? Kind of what are some best practices when it comes to planning to have a negotiation or a communication? Well, when you're when you're working with, with when you're working with older people. Obviously, going in person a lot would be the very, very best way. 
if you're talking about some, you know, some kind of a family issue, I think that the, uh, the uh, most, the craziest thing is to make sure that you make sure that you have everybody represent. Meaning that I think that um, I think we have to make sure we have a situation where, uh, well, like for instance, okay, so I met with grandpa and grandma. Their one son is coming back to the farm. His wife, the daughter-in-law, and then there was a second brother in that family, but he was down in Kansas City. So we didn't we didn't make him drive up to Kansas City for the meeting, but we put him on we put him on a cell phone, and 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 let him let him listen in. He was not the farmer. He didn't have to deal with it, but but he at least got to listen in and ask good questions. And that's the key. You have to let them ask the questions they want to ask and make sure that they're a part of the conversation, so they kind of know what's happening. So that when you make some kind of a deal that and it comes down three or four years down the road and that off farm kid didn't know anything about it, that he's not going, well, wait a minute, what happened here? I wasn't treated, treated equitably because I wasn't a part of the conversation. The big deal there is to make sure they're included in the conversation, especially the younger generations. With the older generations, you have to, in the people in negotiation, you have to be face to face, but also include the other generations too. So they have a representation at the table. They may not have much to say, but at least they got to hear the conversation. Sorry, we probably don't have time for much more than that right now. No, that's okay. Really great advice. Um, I guess I'll kind of, you're right, we're running a little bit low on time, so I'll turn it. Do you have one piece of advice you want to leave our listeners with today when it comes to kind of this communication piece and working with family? Listen, What's your one takeaway? Listen, appreciate the other party. Get them to get, make sure they understand that you're trying to work with them instead of against them. That'll, that'll get you further than anything else. Great. I think that's great advice to close on. Uh, so Alan, I want to thank you for joining us today and thank you in the audience. Great questions and participation. Please do take a moment to complete that quick survey as you exit the webinar. We will be back next month on October 5th. We're going to be talking about hiring farm employees. So that'll be a really great topic. You don't want to miss that one. So until then, take good care and we hope to see you online soon.